And this is why the work is very powerful because it's not just like, oh, positive thinking or something like that or positive word babbling um, because it's not enough. There has to be an integration at the unconscious level. It's not you have it's not just thinking. You have to think, feel it, body, mind. It. And in order to do that, you have to know how to work consciously with the unconscious part of your mind. If you're not getting the results that you desire, chances are you either don't have strong enough desire or you're not willing to do what it takes to get the results, says today's Ask an Expert. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propeller Media. And today I sit down with Gina Malacone Long. Gina is the co-founder of Greatness University, where they help business leaders achieve the results they're looking for by literally helping to rewire how their brain thinks and behaves. Now let's jump in and hear what Gina has to say. Gina, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert series. Oh, thanks for having me on. I always I always feel a bit humble when somebody calls me an expert. Well, we're going to put you to the test a little bit, So, uh, but I've done my research, so I think you qualify. Um, I want to start first with uh, kind of the Genesis story. So out of college, you start doing some marketing and some branding stuff. Um, I'm a big beer guy, as you can see. For those who can't <laughs> see, I've got a wall of beer on my wall. It's a personal hobby of mine, craft brewing. Um, but you were working in branding and beer, and then you transition and you you actually start your own company um, called Greatness You, and I just want to hear how the evolution is because it was pretty early. I don't know that two years, uh, two or three years outside of like me starting my career, I would have been ready to like say, "Hey, let me go put my flag in the sand." Uh, but I'd love to hear your story. Ha! You know, it's funny. Something just popped into my head, so I'm going to start with it. Um, Michael Beckwith once said, "Pain pushes until vision pulls." So um, that's that what that's what made me think. So basically, um, first I worked at Procter and Gamble in brand, and then I jumped to a brewery, Molson Brewery in brand, um, thinking it would be different. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> um, I mean, the products were different. Yeah. And, but but I think what ended up happening was I knew right out of the gate when I got into the corporate world, I was like a you know a fish out of water. But when you're twenty something you know what do you know so I just I thought you know who am I like this is what am I crazy like I got this great job and so you know maybe the problem's me so I kind of just tried to stick it out but it, it if I reflect back the minute I walked through the door I was like nope because I just um the environment wasn't conducive to who I was but you have to remember that there's it's very important to go through this phase where you be who you think you should be. It's Im okay. important to go through it. I'm not saying it's fun or you should stay there, but it is important to go through it. And so my whole life I had been doing all these other things, but then I did my engineering degree and then I had to get a real job and blah, blah, blah. And so, but so right away I was like, oh, this isn't right. So then I tried to jump companies after a few years and then it was still the same. So then it just got to the point where I couldn't ignore it anymore. And so I, I remember I was 25, four, and I said to my husband, I can't keep doing this. He's like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I, I don't know, but not this. And yeah. so I go, and luckily when you're that young, there's not a lot of expenses or risk. <laughs> right. Right. So I just jumped ship and there was no such thing as coaching back then because it wasn't coaches were sport people which I, by the way, had been uh, at one point when I was 16 years old, I held five national coaching certifications. Um, wow. Yeah, the Canadian Coaching Foundation. So um, no, I wasn't a national coach, but I was certified in sure. five sports. So that was my like hobby and my summer jobs and things like that. So when I started, when I, well, I didn't really start, I kind of just left and okay. started, I called it consulting because that was the closest thing. But it it wasn't consulting. It was coaching. I was I was coaching businesses on how to manage their businesses in the same way that I had been taught very well how to manage a brand. And so it was it was coaching. And then that evolved, you know, over time. And and just as I evolved, and my husband was a stockbroker, and then he sold his book, and then we started a corporate training company because we observed that most corporate training sucked. Um, and then we started a coach, uh, corporate team building. And then I started teaching other people what we were doing. It just kind of, so no. I'd love to say I had this massive vision one day, you know, but I didn't, the pain pushed me out the door and then I developed it as I went along. So I, in one of my books, I called it ready, fire, aim. 
that's pretty much (laughs) (laughs) so let's talk about the aiming portion of that because you've already fired um and you know i know especially for entrepreneurs it is like like i don't care if all wheels are on the car we're just going right we'll we'll put the car together as we're doing this but talk to (laughs) me um did you have any semblance of kind of a growth strategy early on in your business directional um so you're shaking your head. So I appreciate that. Like, but how did that evolve over time as you started refining the business and saying, okay, this is really the niche that we want to do. And then yeah. once we've identified that, like, how did you start scaling that? So it, it, it I was going to make a funny quip. Like, so we have this meeting in an hour where we're going to go over that because <laughs> we're, we're still doing it. I mean, when you okay. gave visual of like putting the, you know, like, I don't even know if the wheels are on the car. That's how I feel kind of every day. Okay. Um, because uh, one of the, the things I teach, like a, like very foundational is, and, and I've been doing this, this particular sentence for like 20 years is that the number one quality you have to have is flexibility of behavior, especially for an entrepreneur. Like I cannot stress this enough. So I'm going to repeat it. Flexibility of behavior. Yeah. Which, because if you, if you are attached in any way to the how of what you're doing, I mean, it might work, but generally speaking, you're going to miss where, where you're being guided to, to where the mark, you know, market's taking you or clients yeah. are going or whatever. So there, we've, we've adapted a lot. And, and, and I want to just say this, we, it's not that we don't have a strategy. We do, but, but we, we built it's at such a top level um, based on our values that as long as we were adhering to our values, we were less attached to the execution of what we were doing. And, and so why that matters is because Ultimately, I left the corporate world in 1998, and I have run the same business, i.e. the same business number, Mm -hmm. till now. And it has not always been the same uh, delivery. And the reason why that's important is we've, we've suffered through, you know, we've thrived actually through three recessions, major global crises, right, multiple times. Um, and each time we've emerged stronger and adapted to the circumstances, but in no way could have predicted we would have done that the year prior, right? Okay. So, so I would never have said, for example, because um, we we did corporate training and team building early on when we when we did actually create a strategy when it wasn't just me coaching someone, right? Um, yeah. We did actually have a strategy: corporate training and team building, experiential learning, accelerated learning techniques, blah blah blah. Um, and then, so we were running these corporate training and team building programs. It was, it was me and my husband and a few other people at that point. And um, September 11th happened. And mm. we were very early in our business. And we had a number of events taking place, I, I want to say, on September 12th. It wasn't all on September 12th, but it was like really imminent around September 11th. Yeah. And as you know, the airspace closed. Yeah. So we were flying our staff all over the place for these events, and we could not. Now right. you can't even predict that. And so I was like, ah, and we were, and I was pregnant and, you know, with our first kid and it was like, right. Just the whole thing. Yeah. Like, an office like this big. And um, my husband said to me, well, there's this thing called LinkedIn. And I was like, okay, what, what is that? He's like, well, it's a social media, but remember these are like foreign words. Okay. Yeah. Social right. The platform we're connecting people in other industries. And I think I can find event leaders qualified to lead our programs on the ground. Right. And I was like, okay. And I said, but how are you going to train them? He said, I'm going to use Skype. Remember, it was like, <laughs> I'm going to use Skype. Video All this program. futuristic technology you're dealing with back then. Look yeah. at what we're doing right now. I know, right. I was like, oh, man, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, but like, it's it's the only thing we can do. We have to save these events. And I was like, that was, you know, we have to save these events. The client yeah. can't show up. So we did that. And, and, and it was seamless. And it mm. was exceptionally successful and and we were looked at each other and went um okay our profit margin just went up because <laughs> there's no T&E we yeah. never traveled another staff virtually ever again right like it, the cost of travel just was gone right. we started building a network all over the world now this is 20 years later my husband runs the team building side of the business and i just remember hearing him about a week ago and i said what was that he said oh we just got a team building event in oman and i was like Oh no, sorry, Jordan, not Oman. Sorry. 
And I'm like, when? He's like, it's in a few days. I'm like, how are you pulling that off? He's like, the network, right? Yeah. So, so, but, so the, this, this attachment to being flexible mm-hmm. right, is, it, and so it, for some people, it can be frustrating because it's like, I thought we were a paperclip company, you know, and now we're making, I don't know, staplers. Yeah. So but the thing is, if you don't adapt, you're, you're dead. So that has been absolutely the secret to success, which has been to, instead of requiring the circumstances to change, we, we adapt to what the circumstances put in front of us. Okay. And I like this story because it fits, as I'm doing my research, it fits you to a T, which is, you know, uh, obviously we just lost the queen. So queen is a buzzword that's buzzing in my mind right now. So as I'm doing my prep, I, I found you to be the queen of change, right? You're all about change in this instrument and how we adapt to it and how we perceive it and all the things that we do. So I want to get into this model that you have, the ABC Acme. And so for those of this that are going to be listening to this on the podcast version, I'm just going to try to visualize this for you guys. Uh, Imagine a parallel line, um, parallel to your desk or the earth, right? And on one side is A, and on the other side is B, and then B drips down to C like a V, and then it shoots back up past A and B, and that's where Acme is. So I want to set that stage just for the illustration for those that you know can't see it or haven't seen it. But like, this is the Acme model that you have, you guys have developed. I want you to talk us through what that model is and how it works. So, oh my God, I'm I was literally just before I tuned into this, I was trying to get something done, and I was working on the on a. a program we call Ada Acme. And so um, basically, first of all, for those of you watching, if you're old enough to remember, Acme should make you smile because it's making you think of the Roadrunner and the Coyote and the Anvils, right? And so honestly, this is not a joke. We, this was about two years ago, we have these mechanisms, right, that we teach. And we had this acronym ACM, and it just just doesn't fly, right? It's just like nobody can remember it. Is it CAM? Is it ACM? We were getting it wrong. Yep. And, and we said, we need a catchier thing. And my husband's like, oh, it'd be so great if we could just do ACME, because it's like just such a quintessential thing of our childhood. So I'm sitting there, and I Google the word ACME, and I nearly fell off my chair. ACME is the Greek word for peak or highest point, uh, like <laughs> I run a company called The Greatness Group. We have the training platform called Greatness U. We're all about peak performance. How in two decades did I never know that acne was the ancient Greek word for what we eat, freaking do? Yeah. Okay. And so I'm like, now we got to make this fit, right? So, so I, I'm like, I can, I can get another word out of there, right? So acne stands for the accelerated change mechanisms of excellence. It would be great if it was greatness because that's our company, but I'll take excellence. It's good. Yeah, right, right. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, so I love queen of change, by the way. I'm, I'm just like literally thinking of changing my business card. Um, <laughs> because so so here here's the thing about um, success or or leaders or coaching or, or whatever you're trying to do. It's all about getting to that next level. And so Acme really is. So if A is where you're at, Acme is your next level. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the things you should notice is when you get to your next level, there's always another level. It's kind of like if you've ever gone, you know, hiking in the mountains near where you live, you get to the top and then there's like another higher one off in the distance. Oh, that process only ends if the one in the distance is Mount Everest, by the way. So like (laughs) Acme is always there. And so my entire life has been dedicated to getting people from A to Acme as quickly as possible. A, where you are now. Acne, where you want to be, your highest point, whatever that is. And it's it's evolutionary over time. So what was your acne today will be your comfort zone tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it just keeps evolving over time. Now, my background is my undergraduate degree is in engineering, process control. And so I'm a process holic. Yeah. And everything I do, I try to turn into a system it's because I'm lazy, right? So yeah. I just want to replicate. I don't want to think. And so um, this diagram, and I was looking to see if I could share it on my screen, but anyways, this diagram looks like a check mark, the one you yeah. just described, right? right? So, you know, you're kind of A is where you are, and then there's this dip down and then up. To Shoot that, up. Yep. Right. And so so first of all, there, there are these five sort of stages on the on that diagram. A is where you are, that's your comfort zone. No change is possible because there's no movement. Yep. B is when the movement starts, right? Okay. So B is where 
the desire to change has been awoken, right? There's a desire. So in A, there's no desire. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. You're, you're unconsciously incompetent. You don't even know. Like it's just it's bliss. That's why they say ignorance is bliss. Right. Okay. B is where you realize you don't know something or you don't have something and you want it. So what we say is you're consciously incompetent. Okay. So you know you want it, but you don't know how to do it, but it's required. Without that desire, nothing starts. Yeah. Okay. Now I just want to say here, it's, you've moved out of the comfort zone. So I just want to be clear to everyone listening. This is very important. By definition, it will be uncomfortable. By definition. Because you've so left the comfort zone. Right. Stop complaining that when things are changing or you're growing, that it's uncomfortable. It's supposed to be. Yeah. Right. Now, desire is not enough, but desire is required. And it's got to be your desire and it's got to be a burning desire. Then what happens, and the reason why the, the diagram goes down is you don't, you you have the components, like you kind of have all the components, but you don't have the sequence. So there's this period of trial and error. And depending on your capacity for coping or your resilience, right? You can withstand more falling down than others. So, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight kind of thing. But usually you'll have a limit. And when you hit that limit, most people will want to quit because that's, what they're used to. They're like, I've given it all I have. I want to quit. But what I'm here to tell you is that's all you had based on the previous comfort model. Right. But it's not all you have capital H. And this is, this is being, you know, your chance to dig deeper. And so um, I lovingly refer to this downward part of the diagram as hell. And only because, not because I'm super brilliant, but because Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And so I was like, oh, perfect. So he knew something about change or about progress. And he also said, never, ever quit. And I thought, wow, those things are true because ultimately you will find the sequence. Now, here's a total tip. If someone's ever done it before, copy them. Yeah. Like you talked about scaling. There are coaches who coach literally scale, like, use them, hire them, use a model that already exists. And if one doesn't exist, then you're going to have to do it yourself. It's not impossible, but it's just more work. So then you break through that's point C and that's why there's an inflection point because now you've produced the new behavior, the result, whatever, but that's not enough. It's not enough just to do it once. It's like taking a baby who just learned to walk and having them cross the busiest street in your town. Are you crazy? (laughs) Well, Now you have to integrate those behaviors till they become dominant. Think wax on, wax off. Yeah. Once they're dominant and you couldn't not do it that way, even if you tried, you wake up in the morning, that's just who you are. Then you're at the acne because now it's an integrated behavior in who you are. That becomes a new comfort zone. You, you enjoy that for a period of time and then it starts again. And so I get you know, people, I, I, I sort of, I like to boil things down and I want to boil it down to this. Any breakthrough is possible mm-hmm. if two preconditions are met. One, you have a burning desire for whatever it is you're trying to do. And two, you have a willingness to give it what it takes. So right. that's a, that's a, a, that means don't ever quit no matter what. As long as you do those two things, anything's possible. Okay, so let's talk about um, changes, as you meant. Uh, A is my comfort zone, right? And so B is, yeah, B is like I now have like experienced desire for something else. Between B and C is this like, it's the the rocky patch, right? And so you've got some tools that we can use to help us facilitate. And you may place them in different areas, but as I'm doing my research, a couple of them really um, piqued my interest. So the first one that I wanna talk about is critical faculty. Can you explain what that is and how we should leverage that? Well, so, okay, um, how's the best way to say this? So so there, you're, you have a mind, everyone has a mind. And um, a lot of the work we do is taking a mechanistic view of the mind. Okay, so I keep I always point to the head because that's where people sort of think the mind is, but we don't know where the mind is. Right. I can I can sit here and argue that the mind is outside of us, but whatever. So so you have a mind. And then if we were to look at the mechanistically, that means like like a machine. It doesn't mean you are a machine. Believe me when I tell you that my my real work and my real passion, like, you know, when I'm working late at night is 
the opposite of that. I actually think we're in, we're capable of incredible, um, out of this world greatness. But if we look at it like a machine, it allows us to simplify this incredibly complex concept. Okay. So there's your mind. And if we look at it like a machine, we can first, we can just break it down to conscious mind and unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So conscious mind is everything you're conscious of and unconscious mind is everything you're not conscious of. <laughs> Super complicated. Now, I always say to people like, your, your, your conscious mind's kind of in charge of goal setting, you know, imagination, willpower, all your sensory uh, perception mm -hmm. is conscious, right? The unconscious mind is really only in charge of three domains. One, it's in charge of all of your time memory storage, all of your sort of recording of what's happened to you. Okay. Two, it's in charge of your body. And three, it's in charge of your emotions, Okay. And your body, I mean, think about it. You know, you showed me earlier that you were having some coffee and some lemon ginger or whatever. But right now you're not consciously going, okay, I'm going to need the lemon ginger enzyme to kick in here, right? That's your yeah. unconscious mind's just doing that. Yeah. Luckily, we don't have to think about it. So the, and this again, this isn't a real thing in your body, just so we're clear, these are concepts. So the critical faculty is the part of you that cares to distinguish between reality and fantasy. It's sort of like the, the gate way between okay. the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, right? Carl Jung did all his work in the unconscious mind, um, you know, dreams, archetypes, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all what we would not, our conscious minds would not consider reality. Okay. So this critical faculty is the part of you that cares to distinguish between reality and fantasy. Now, here's why this is important. Up until about age seven, you don't have one. Okay. Okay. Period. Developmentally, just this is a psychological principle. You can read this in, you know, people puzzle or whatever. Like this is just psychology 101. So up until about age seven, around age seven, kids start saying, um, mommy, is that real? Daddy, is that real? Is that real? Is that real? Mm -hmm. Right. So what's happening is the development of the critical faculty. Now, when you consciously determine something to be real or true, you live by its rules. Okay. Okay. So if you have a belief that is uh, real, okay, um, for you, called I'm not good enough or whatever, lots of people have these, right? Sure. And you act like this is true and you go about your business, you you can't just override that because for you, it's consciously true. Why this is important in the work that we do is all of the mechanistic tools that we use, we work consciously with the unconscious mind, which is where all our beliefs and habits and programs are stored. And in order to do that, we have to know how to bypass the critical faculty so that we can change at the foundational level, these beliefs or these decisions or whatever, so that they can then become true, accepted as true by the conscious mind. Okay. Right? Then you go about your business. And this is why the work is very powerful because it's not just like, oh, positive thinking or something like that or positive word babbling um, because it's not enough. There has to be an integration at the unconscious level. It's not, you have, it's not just thinking, you have to think, feel it, body minded. And in order to do that, you have to know how to work consciously with the unconscious part of your mind. And the only way you can do that is to know the mechanisms for bypassing that critical faculty. So it's just it's just like um, I got the maps, I got the tools, I know how to do it. It's, it's super simple. But if you don't know how to do it, it can be major daunting, right? right? Because bypassing the critical faculty, although it's simple, it's not super easy. But you do it all the time. Like if you go to watch um, Superman, okay, let's just say we go watch the original Superman. Sure. Okay? And we're sitting there, we're watching it. You and I both know in the reality that we live in currently today, men can't just put their arms up in the air and fly. <laughs> and fly, right. Okay? We kind of know that. And so we sit in the movie and then he does that. Now, if you had your critical faculty fully engaged, you'd throw tomatoes at the screen and go ballistic. You'd be like, that's bullshit. Right. 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 But because we want to be entertained, what happens is we go, you know what? Now, this isn't conscious. It's unconscious. I'm going to relax my critical faculty because I want to be entertained. 
Now here's the power because you're a marketing guy and I work in advertising for one of the biggest companies in the world. Let me tell you something. The moment you relax your critical faculty in a movie, in a, in a movie or a, a television program or whatever, that is the exact moment of product placement. Mm. Just from a marketing perspective, what you need to understand because your critical faculty is dissolved at this point. Yeah, so now right. you can put by my thing in your mind while your mind's open. Right. And I say to people all the time, okay, I'm a master trainer of hypnosis. There is no higher designation in the boards of hypnosis, right? Board certified. I worked as an advertising executive and I'm here to tell you without question, all advertising is hypnosis. It's a right. process of hypnosis. Now people are like, Wah! right? No, no. Here's the definition of hypnosis. When you are in a trance state, I make a suggestion to you and you accept that suggestion. That's that's the definition. Okay. The, the acceptance of selective thinking while in a trance state. Okay. That's like a, a you know, a definite, an academic definition. So watching a TV or a screen, even watching this video right now, mm -hmm. what we don't realize is the screens are flickering. Right. That produces a trance. A trance is just a brainwave state, slightly slower than alpha waves. Alpha is where you can start to enter, but it's slower than that. Okay. okay? And the screen, if you've ever taken a picture of a screen, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, 100%. Yep. Okay. That induces this brainwave state. Okay. Okay. Now, when I come out with my washing powder or my toothpaste or my coffee or whatever, if I suggest to you while you're in that state that you should buy that, then I've done what I've done is I've induct, induced selective thinking while you're in a trance. Now, when I tell this to people, they're like, what? And I go, they go, but uh, hypnosis is malarkey. I go, well, do we pay millions and millions of dollars for malarkey in our culture? Maybe, maybe not. But value, the higher, the more something costs generally in our culture, the more we think it's valuable. And the last I checked, and, and I haven't worked in advertising in a long time, Super Bowl ads, 30 seconds were millions of dollars. Yeah, right. So if this is malarkey, why are people paying millions, millions for a 30 second spot? Now, you could take that and go make commercials and good for you. But that's not why I told you this. Why I told it to you is this mechanism. Hypnosis is a mechanism works regardless of who's doing it or why you're doing it. So what if you did it because you wanted to implant in your mind empowering beliefs or beliefs you needed to adopt or remove beliefs you didn't want or you know create a, a mental picture of a, an outcome or whatever why wouldn't you use that mechanism but in order to use that mechanism you have to know the mechanism and in order to know the mechanism you have to open your freaking mind to learn hypnosis in the first place instead of going with all the other sheep and saying oh that's malarkey right because let me tell you something about secrets the people that are really successful on the planet today, and believe me when I tell you I've studied a lot of them, that's all I do is study. The best way to hide a secret is to put it in a plain view and criticize it from a position of authority. Hmm. So that's my way. <laughs> well, it's a good one because I'm glad you brought up um, hypnosis because that was going to be my next question. But is we're talking about critical faculty, right? So you talked about the marketing side of it, right? You know, smart people leveraging, you know, television and waves and planting suggestive products or services. How do we do that? to ourselves like what is the process that we go through because as i was looking at you know kind of this critical faculty the, the word that kept jumping into my mind is manifesting right you know we hear a lot about this like manifest you know i've got my vision board i you know whatever these tools are like what is from your approach like what are the ways that we say hey we know we have this gatekeeper between the conscious and the subconscious what is the tools or what are the methods that i can start doing to say hey i do have a vision i have something that i want to do but I want to be more critical about it with my subconscious. What do I do? Okay, so a couple of things. I'm a process person, so I'll just talk you through a basic process blueprint that would apply regardless of the technique. Okay. And then there are techniques that obviously work better than others, but but the process th itself is simple. And I also want to make a distinction here because Freud used to call it the subconscious mind. Jung calls it the unconscious mind. Sub implies lower, and I want to yeah. tell you something. It's absolutely anything but lower. Right. Okay? In fact, I think it's the opposite. So maybe we call it the super conscious. I don't know. But um, so there, there are three components to the process of changing your mind. 
Okay. First, you need a trance. Some some way, and so you could call that. Uh, um, you could do you could do any any way to put yourself to slow down. Breathing technique, yoga. Um, you could watch TV. You could listen to you binaural beats. There's a million products out there that are designed to put you into a trance. Fastest way to put someone into a trance is fear. Okay. Just saying, because the world right now is full of it. Yeah. And I just want you to pay attention to um, the mechanism. Once you're in a trance, then I suggest to you. Okay. So if, if someone else is putting you in a trance by a fear, then what they're suggesting is becoming your, you're accepting it. I'm instantly seeing news media today, right? Oh so. my God. <laughs> just so we're clear and I'll share a secret of success. Shut it off. Yeah. I haven't watched news media since March of 2020. Bravo. The day my business revenue went to zero. Mm, right. And I'm still here. Yeah. Right? Now, why? And you talked about this word manifesting. We throw it around like it's like this, this buzz pop culture word. <laughs> okay. If you knew your capacity for creating, you would become such a custodian of your mind. But very few people are willing to do it. I say everything I teach is simple. But it's not easy. It requires discipline. Wax on, wax off. I, I wax yep. on, wax. Leave. I went to karate the other day. I, I started. I'm going to get my black belt before I turn 60, and uh, I just started. And we literally did. Like I said, oh my god, are we doing the, <laughs> the, the movement? The right. We're literally. I was learning how to block the basic block, and yep. I'm like, oh my, god, we're waxing on and off, <laughs> right? And I'm practicing it every day. And so the thing is, is it's simple, but it's, it's it requires discipline. Okay. So mechanism is once you're in a trance, your unconscious mind will accept any suggestion. Okay. So that means then you need to prepare your suggestions ahead of time, i.e. you need to know what you want. You need to define it. Okay. Okay. And then you need to have a closure process that kind of seals it in, you know, like a Tupperware or something like that. Okay. That's all. Everything I teach, every single technique I teach leverages that basic process. Some sort of um, slowing down of the mind or access, bypassing the critical faculty. Some sort of suggestion, whether it's a new belief or a learning or blah, 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 whatever. And then some kind of like closure process. And then that's the basic process. Okay. Um, so... You could go, you know, like, let's just start with the classic hypnotherapy. You could go, they put you in a trance, however they do it. They know they they wave a watch or do some imagery or read a script. Once you're, the trance has been established, then you would read the suggestions or say yeah. them or whatever. But you can't start thinking of them at that time. You have to already have known what they're going to be. Right. right. And then, because then it goes in, and then you count them out or close it up. So I say to people, um, you know, what do you want to believe? Well, I want to believe that I'm, you know, powerful. Okay. So they'll say, well, I went to hypnosis and it didn't work. Well, here's the thing. There is no thing happening, right? I'm not, I don't. I'm not doing it to you. You're yeah. allowing it to happen. So if you block it, it's game over. You can block any advertising on the planet. When I sit down to watch TV, I go, don't accept any suggestions that don't serve me. Now, the reason why I say that is because sometimes I too need to buy washing powder. So maybe I want to watch it. <laughs> but I block out what doesn't serve me. And I just give the command and it has to follow it. Right? Mm -hmm. So now people will say, oh, I, I, I tried that didn't work. Well, you either didn't have a desire for the change or you weren't willing to do what it takes. And they go, well, I did, I did, I, I had a desire. Well, then you weren't willing to do what it takes. No, I did. I did the whole process. Yeah, but sometimes the willingness requires to let go of a belief that's preventing that belief. Mm. Okay. And this is where the nuances of the work that I've studied for the last 20 years come into play. Because sometimes what you have to do first is remove what's preventing the yeah. acquisition interesting of, right yeah, right and that's the work that's the work that i love to do like i i i take about a dozen private clients in a year i don't i don't have because it's 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 a lot of work and i'm really looking for very specific um clients on a desire and willingness scale right okay. but we spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time discerning these underlying beliefs that have to go first. Okay. Once they're gone, 
it's easy. Right. And then, so it's sort of like, I always use the analogy of a garden, right? So, you know, you come to me, you say, I want an English garden. I want this fancy English garden with all this ivy and whatever, whatever. And I see the picture very clearly and I go, okay, got it. And then I spend a lot of time um, discerning what kind of garden do you have, right? What's in your garden right now? Mm. You know, weeds and rocks and trees and bunnies and raccoons and, right? And I go, okay, none of those things can be there for this English garden. So we pull out the weeds, the rocks, the bunnies, right? Yep. We send the bunnies to a bigger pasture and whatever, okay? Then it's just a clean slate. Then we use some of these um, very poignant techniques to plant uh, the selective thinking that's required. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not enough. They, oh, yeah, you're done. Have a nice day. <laughs> then you have to water it and pull the weeds and, you know, maybe a, a seed. We've missed a seed and it grows and you got to pull it out and you got to be responsible for your garden. And you got to do this until, and this could take, you know, days, weeks, months, years until the garden is exactly the way you wanted it. And so that's why I'm saying there's this whole process of change. Right. Because, um, you know, you've got to go through these different stages of letting go of the way it is now to create the way you want it to be. It's not just enough to, like, keep adding on. Right? Sometimes you got to move out completely. And so... Um, uh, you know, any technique where if you, you we, we teach um, three very, and they're not, I didn't create, I created a lot of things, but I didn't create three of the major techniques that we teach. We teach NLP, timeline therapy and hypnosis combined because they're all similar, but different, but they're all designed to do what we just said. Um, work consciously with the unconscious mind, remove the obstacles and implant the, the desired selective thinking to produce the reality that matches that thinking. So let's talk about timeline therapy because that was actually next on my list. So this is flowing perfectly here. Um, explain what timeline therapy is and how we use it. Sure. I mean, it's almost like we're connected at the unconscious level. Um, <laughs> So timeline therapy is a time-based technique. So it's a temporal, we use the temporal, temporal means time. We use the temporal perspective to, which means we we use time as a variable okay. to, to essentially, and I'm speaking metaphorically, go back in time and change the past. Right. So what we do is we liberate the past so that you have a chance of creating the future that you want. And here's the way I explain it. Um, I, you know, sometimes people quote me, not often, uh, but sometimes, well, I'm not Socrates, but, you know. I'll be quoting you today, so that's yeah. all right. Well, you I, 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 I asked at one point, it's not, not the right time right now, but at one point asked me for my, my favorite one, but this is an important one. So I'll say the future that you're trying to create depends on the past that you choose. Okay. And people will quote that. And then invariably somebody will put a comment, oh, you spelled path wrong. Because <laughs> they think I was trying to say the future that you create is dependent on the path that you choose. But yeah. it's not the past, past that you choose. And they go, how can you change your past? Right? Right. Now, here's the thing. Um, the, the events of your life happened. So I'm not a lunatic. Okay? We, we, we can't change the events. But there's a difference between the events and the meaning that got attached to the events. The events happened. Yep. The meaning was assigned. And it's the meaning that's crippling you now. Okay? So timeline therapy allows us to do some visualization with a little bit of quantum mechanics. Okay? So that's where the time as a variable comes into play and some of the mathematical positions of the visualization. They're, they're deliberately mathematical, certain angles and certain things like that. So it's sort of, a, you know, there's a little bit of technique in there. Okay? It's not super complicated, but it's it, there's a little bit of quantum mechanics and obviously a ton of desire and willingness on the client's part. And what we can do is we can actually go back in time and reframe the event, not change it from having happened, Right. change the meaning. The minute you change the meaning, okay, you're on a different path. So I often draw these this diagram with all these colored lines. You know, and I'll, 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 in a classroom, I'll, I'll 
will say, um, you know, if you ever go to a psychic, what the psychic does is they tune into the patterns of you right now. That's what they do. And some are more skilled than others. Um, and if you didn't change at all, a skilled psychic could predict where you're going to be based on patterns. It's just the blueprint. It's like, if you look at the blueprint of a chair, you could predict it's going to look like a chair. <laughs> right, right. It's not that complicated if you have the skill So and the gift. So a skilled, gifted psychic could tune into where you are now. And as long as nothing changed, they could predict where you're going to go. And it would be more or less accurate. But the thing about humans is we have the capacity to change, change our minds. And so if you're on the, you know, this blue line and the psychic sort of tunes in, you're on a blue line and the psychic will say, you're going to have a blue future. Yep. But you say, well, I want a red future. Here's the thing. You can't have a red future unless you're on a red line. And the only way to get from the blue line is from the red line, to, from the blue line to the red line is to change time. But right. you can't go back in time because that's crazy. But you can go back using some of these techniques. Timeline therapy is probably the most powerful one I know and change the meaning in time and then assign it to the now, which then puts you just on the red path. And then the red path outcome is inevitable. Right. So it's, so people, I guarantee my results when I work with private clients, people can't believe me. They're like, are you crazy? Well, first of all, I have an unbelievably um, accurate selection process, which I do not pray. I, I turn down most people that I take. You okay. have to get through the first gate. After that, all I got to do using the techniques I know, like timeline therapy, is get them from the blue line to the red line. And then the red outcomes literally guaranteed. Just got to shoot them like a puck on the ice and they'll get there. Yeah. And so it's not, I'm not a Pollyanna. I am not a Pollyanna. I don't walk around thinking it's rose colored world. It's right. not them. I can see the world for, for what's put in front of me. But the thing is, I'm a process person. And as long as you meet the stages of the process like process control was my undergraduate thesis so as long as you meet the stages required to produce the outcome and the machinery works you're going to get the outcome it's just how a machine works right so i'm not suggesting humans are machines but but are but we're kind of machinery like especially when it comes to and i'm going to use your word manifesting or yep. producing results right it's a machinery it's mechanistic and timeline therapy, even though it sounds like this airy fairy floofy thing, is actually quite a linear mechanistic model, right? No yeah. different than NLP or time or hypnosis, just different in its, you know, nuances of what it's actually doing, right? So um, timeline therapy uses a temporal perspective to go to go and change the meaning, which means change literally. Now I'm not talking metaphorically, I'm talking literally. Yeah. Change. You, after you come back to the now in the technique, it's changed. You're like, I remember this happening to me as a client a number of years ago. I was like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> right? Like, I thought it was going to be like, oh, that was so nice. It was, there were physiological changes in my body when I let go of certain limiting beliefs. Sure. And then um, timeline or hypnosis uses the trance state. So timeline therapy uses a temporal perspective. Hypnosis mm -hmm. uses the trance state in, in its purity. Yep. NLP uses the language, language of the mind. So it's it's a much more cerebral process. So it uses a language model to, to kind of remodel the mind, right? It's more conscious. So but the three of them go really well together depending on what you're trying to achieve. Well, I like the timeline one just because personally, I feel, I'm a visual guy. And so I love this, you know, uh, illustration of, you know, I want the red line and I look behind me and I see him on the blue line. And really what I'm hearing is like these things that happen in our lives um, are real, but what we assign to them, and I'm just going to call it baggage, right? You know, it's the ball and chain, the bad thing happened. And suddenly I assign a ball and chain to it. I may be healed from what actually happened, but I have this lingering anchor that is just perpetually keeping me back there. And what you're saying is like, hey, you can't change the past, but you can change how it impacted you. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just love that illustration. And, 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 and I am not, I want to be really clear because I, it's pretty, like, I know a lot of techniques. I'm certified in a, an arm's length full of stuff. And timeline therapy is probably at the top of my list because it, it, the, the, it, the impact of it is real. Okay. Right. So 
um, it's it, it's not a metaphor. It's not like, oh, you resolved it. No, 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 no. It's gone from your neurology. It's no longer the obstacle holding you back. Okay. And now you are free to create in the moment. And I love your word baggage because um, it, in a metaphor, what timeline therapy does is let you put down the bag. Yeah. And then in the now, you can create a future because it's not based on Right. Anything in the past. Right. All right. We're going to pivot. We're going to move into the quick fire round. Um, mm -hmm. So these are, I don't want you to think too much. This is just a quick question, quick answer. Um, do you have a favorite podcast right now? No, no, I don't. Okay. You can I, I, I listen to everything. I mean, I the Association of the Post-Materialist Scientists, that's what I was listening to before you and I uh, got talking. Well, I'm not a hypnotist, so this won't work, but I'm going to suggest that Ask an Expert is going to become your favorite podcast. So. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> perfect. Um, professional inspiration. Do you have, whether living um, past um, anybody that you kind of just say, um, and it doesn't have to be the pinnacle, but maybe a Mount Rushmore of, you know, these are the people that I look to up to for uh, professional inspiration. So many, but I would think Carl Jung is way up there because okay. the guy was a genius absolute yeah. genius um but yeah i mean i i mean you, you know the late bob proctor was one of the biggest mentors in my life early early on okay. um, but even like like i know this sounds so stupid but like mr miyagi yoda like these are characters <laughs> right right but they they and then and then academic writers like dion fortune like like it's all over the place. Um, Isaac Newton, I did my master's in philosophy, my thesis on Isaac Newton, right? Because as a scientist, I was shocked to learn that Isaac Newton was an alchemist and wrote more on theology than he ever wrote on science. Interesting. Well, I so know, we're right? all learning here. Um, favorite book? Ooh, the, well, <laughs> fiction, fiction would be The Mists of Avalon, no question. Okay. But nonfiction, I really like The Alchemist by, um, uh, it's a, it's fiction. It's fiction. It is fiction, but it's a fantastic book. Right? Like, yeah. I, I literally buy that book by like, I don't want to say the dozens, but I, I love handing it out. So. And what I give to all my clients, and this is a children's book, but all you all um, who are interested in timeline therapy would kind of like it. It's called The Little Soul in the Sun by Neil Donald Walsh. And it's a story about why people do mean things because it's a kid's book. But um, it, I give it to every client and every student because we teach timeline therapy. And I want them to understand that while things happened in your life that were unpleasant, um, it's your it's your making them mean that they were wrong and bad that's holding you back. Right? Okay. And so as a, uh, it's an amazing book, um, especially for kids, but for adults too. Okay. Um, early Riser, Burning the Midnight Oil. Me? Yeah. Both. Oh, okay. All right. No, well, actually, you know what? If I really, early, well, I, I get up early, but I don't do my best work. I do my best work late. Does okay. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm an early riser as well. I used to think that, and I still do get up early. It's just now I go for a long walk, right? Start my day, ease into it. But usually, it's like later that I start seeing like all the chemistry come to. So. I do all my work in the morning, right? I do yeah. my meetings and my my meditations and all that work. And then I do my, like this kind of stuff later in my day. Yeah. Uh, last one, favorite pizza. Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Okay. And actually I'm going to incorporate one more uh, because you did say to ask favorite quote. Oh, well, um, this is mine. Uh, okay. if someone doesn't want to change. There's nothing you can do to change them. Okay. And if someone wants to change, there is nothing you can do to stop them. Now that's, I that's me. I say that, but, but I really would like to recite for you my absolute favorite words that are probably the most important um, words written. So Marion Williamson wrote a book called a return to love Okay. in it. She, there's a passage now Nelson Mandela adopted the passage for his inauguration speech. So a lot of people attribute this quote to Mandela, but it comes from a return to love by Marion Williamson. Okay. And, and I use this for all of my clients, right? Because she said, our deepest fear is not that our, we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. Mm. We ask ourselves, you know, it's, it, she says, it is, it's our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are we not to be? 
right? You're a child of God. You're playing small, doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so small that others won't feel insecure around you, right? We were all born to make manifest the glory that's within us, but it's not just in me or you, it's in everyone. So as we um, give permission, right, as we let our own light shine, we give permission for others uh, to do the same. As we are liberated from fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Well, so let's talk about that because I, I think that's interesting and I'm hearing a couple different things. So I want to open this up. We have this fear of what we could become of, you know, how great we could become. But I feel like, um, and maybe it's inaccurate, but like I feel like the go-to is there's a fear of failure. Right. And so I feel like for a lot of people, it is I'm going to fall flat on my face. I'm going to do A, B and C. But really, so reconcile those two. Well, maybe I, here's my this has been my my experience as a as a when I work, especially when I work like with peak performers as in a coach role. Right? OK, um, so our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. My experience is that when I'm doing timeline therapy with with somebody who's, you know, trying to bust through to the next level, they they can more quickly get to letting go of their baggage, as you termed it, you know, their negative emotions, their limiting decisions, their limiting beliefs, they can bring those to the surface pretty easily. Like, it's not too hard to get them to say, yeah, you know what, I I don't think I'm good enough or whatever. Like, you can kind of get there. It is the, the work and the reason why a breakthrough with me takes the, the, you know, 12 or so hours that it takes is because I have to hold such a tight container for them declaring who they are. Mm. I'm powerful. I'm creative. I'm forgiving. I'm whatever. They, 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 they dance around these words. They sometimes they don't even have the words. So we yeah. like they uttered the words. They, they feel awkward saying them, owning them. Right. So, mm-hmm. so, I think it's a cop out when people say they're afraid to fail because that's crazy. Everybody fails. Okay. Just watch a baby learning to walk. So if you, you know, any, anything you've ever done, you, you had to fail to get there. Yeah. Everybody fails. So we can't be afraid of something we kind of already know about, but it's this fear of success. Like what would happen if, I expanded because there's right. no boundary and boundaries make us feel safe. Mm. So I actually think my, my opinion is that it's a fear of power, a fear of success because, right. because it's the unknown. We don't know. Right. Failure, I mean, I wrote a book called the secret of successful failing a long time ago. It's not a book about how to fail. Right. And I met this guy once and he's like, Oh, I don't fail. I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like, this isn't a, an ego contest. Yeah. It's right. About understanding that failure is a natural part of learning to do something new. Right. Mm-hmm. It's the uncomfortable part outside of your comfort zone. The, the, the best performers in the world fail as fast as they can. Just get there, get the feedback and get on with it. Everybody else sits there and goes, oh, and they judge it and they they go, see, I knew I wasn't good enough. See, I knew I couldn't do it. See, and they use it to prove their model of reality. And I got, and I want to be clear. I kind of want to end on this note. I want to be clear. I'm not the greatness police. I don't think there's anything wrong inherently, capital W. I'm not trying to save anybody from anything or save the world from anything. I actually think that everything's playing out according to the map, the map that we've set. So if we don't like it, we are responsible for changing it. We don't like our the way our life's mapped out, change it, right? So the only question I ever ask anybody when they talk to me about anything is, how is that working for you? Right. Like, it, you you don't have to make a million or, or raise three kids or have a business or work in a company or get promoted or have a partner or play hockey or whatever. There is no universal stick of your worth your worth is built into the fact that you're here so instead when you tell me what your life is i just say how's that working for you and you go it is i go great right and you say it's not and i go oh what do you plan to do about that and it brings us back to the beginning of the of this um session right you asked me how did i get out of the corporate at such a young age and la 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 i sat there and went this isn't working 
right. this is not working for me. And it's my responsibility to change it. It's my responsibility to choose to do something, be something, have something different. And so that's all I did was act on it. And it wasn't comfortable at all. It's awful. Right. But I got through it and I mucked through it and I mucked through it. And if I look back, I, you know, what I thought was so challenging in 1998, I, I literally could do in my sleep backwards crab walking <laughs> with my feet tied together. Right. So I want to ask you, we've been through, uh, and, and we, we talked before we started this. Um, obviously we've all been through kind of a whirlwind of craziness. Um, and there's no, does it, the train doesn't appear to be stopping anytime soon. Um, so I just kind of like wanted to talk about the fact that, uh, and I guess it piggybacks on what you just said, looking backwards, everything that you thought you were going through and what you were enduring and you were going through it, but like looking backwards, you're like, Oh, cakewalk. Like, <laughs> Gina, wait till you get older kind of thing, right? Like, then you'll know kind of thing. But like, we are in this, I just feel like it's rapid, accelerated um, pressure. And it's coming from everywhere, right? We have career professional pressures, we have family pressures, we have societal pressures, we have economic, like, I just feel like, at least personally in my life, I've never been in a, in a time where there's just so many different things what are your recommendations to just like hit pause, you know, and I'm not expecting us to pause for 10 years for us to be able to look back and say, Oh, don't worry. That wasn't that hard. Like, what do we do in the now to be able to say, Hey, this really isn't life is happening, you know, focus on what's important. Like, what are your recommendations to people out there that are just struggling right now? Because there's just so much happening. Right. Well, um, first of all, let, let me just say this directly to everybody who's listening or watching. Um, if you could, didn't have the capability, the inherent latent capacity to handle this, you would not be here at this time in history. So I would just want to be clear that if you're here, it's because you have the capacity. That doesn't mean you're actualizing it, but you have it. Right. Okay? You asked me who I admired. Somebody I really, really admire is Ilya Prigogine, who won the Nobel Prize in 1977, because he demonstrated that systems that are going undergoing entropy, which is like pressure, temperature, you know, like you yeah. called it, like just accelerating uh, pressure on the system. Um, the, up until Prigogine won the Nobel Prize, it was assumed that all those systems go to chaos, which is kind of what everybody's feeling, chaos. Yeah, right. Prigogine won the Nobel Prize because he showed and demonstrated that there is a, a bifurcation point, which means bifurcate, right? Yep. There's a choice choice point where the system can reorganize completely, like a complete reorg, such that the entropy that was recently threatening to destroy it is like nothing, okay? Okay. So think uh, rotting tree gook is carbon atoms in the forest, right? You live in yeah. Portland, there's a lot of this, okay? rotting tree gook. Those are just carbon atoms. Put those in a very specific environment, temperature, pressure, and that carbon becomes a diamond. Right. Okay. Hardest substance on the planet, only a diamond can cut a diamond. So, so, but it, what I do is I extrapolate Prigogine's work and I say it requires you to choose to recognize you need a reorg. Now I'm not the reorg police. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not the media police. I'm not the, so you want chaos, chaos, just like go nuts. I honestly live and let live. That is truly my perspective. However, if you tell me, Gina, it's not working for me. Yeah. I'm telling you, you're at a point where you have to choose if you're going to bifurcate into a more complex system. What the hell does that mean, Gina? It means you need to develop coping mechanisms that you don't already have because you didn't need them till now. Mm. Are you going to know what to do? Probably not. If you did, you'd already freaking do it. <laughs> so find teachers, read yeah. books, listen to podcasts like this one, right? Expand your mind, pick up techniques along the way that allow you to develop that capacity into reality so that you can handle more pressure, craziness, chaos. Right. And like you said, and maybe there is, you you are feeling a need to pause. Mm -hmm. like, look, look um, we can all manage about 126 bits of information a second. And there are millions or billions of trillions available to us. And, and I did something, and I'm not even joking. March 2020, I went, nope, 
because yeah. not because I'm a, an idiot. People are like, you gotta be informed. Okay, first of all, if it's super important, 14 people will text me. <laughs> right. Secondly, yeah. secondly, if I need to know something, I have trusted data sources where I go to collect the data based on my terms. Yeah. Not somebody else's terms. And if I need to go get data, I would consider it to be hard or bad news or whatever. I put myself in a resourceful state first, then I ingest the, the information. Okay. Because it was all coming at me and I felt like I was on fire. Right. right? So, so that's a coping mechanism. Now, I haven't had a social media app on my phone in two years. And while I miss the odd birthday or cool photo, you know, from time to time, my kids show me something or whatever. For the most part, though, it's just quieter. Yeah. And what's happened is the bandwidth I used to give to that is free. And I use it now. And and so we're evolving even our company this year. I mean, 2020, March, zero yep. revenue. And I turned to my husband and said, huh. We teach all these powers of like creating results and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, money's easy to make. Well, we have been presented with the golden opportunity of proving that shit, it. right? And within a year, we had completely pivoted all our programs into a virtual environment. So now we're, we don't just do virtual, but we, now we do hybrid, right? Mm. So as people come back in person, we do in person, we do, but it's allowed us to expand our reach. Our target market is mostly coaches and business leaders. Well, the biggest complaint they had was, I don't have any time to travel for your course. Well, now they can do it from wherever they are. Right. So, but I, up until the day that everything changed, I said to a student, it can't be done. It's amazing how necessity <laughs> causes you to go, well, actually, I think it can. Well, and you have a quote that I, I remember, and I may butcher it, but it's something to the effect of um, people think they're giving it their all, but they're not giving all that it takes. Right. And and I watched the, the video that you shared, and it was a video of, a, I think it's a 400 meter race, and right out of the blocks, a, a sprinter trips, and she's down, and like, these are... These are sprinters, right? You know, and 400 meters is a pretty relatively short race. And she gets up and she actually wins the race. And it wasn't, you know, if you'd asked her before she fell, if she fell at the starting box, if she thought she would win, she she might have said no. I, I don't know what she would have said. Well, but... I actually remember the interview. Okay. So it was an 800 meter oh, 800. Okay. indoor track. It was indoor track. And um, they were on the bell lap. Mm -hmm. So they were at full speed. Right. Okay. And they were on the bell lap. And these are, this is NCAA track. Yep. And she races the same people every week. Right. Okay. So she kind of knows where she fits in the whole thing. And she would yep. have expected to win because at the end of the race, they said, how did you do that? And she said, my job was to win, to get the mm -hmm. points. Right. That was my job. So I had to execute my job. So she clearly knew what her job was or what her goal was. Okay. Yep. And then in the middle of the bell lap, she falls and probably loses, I don't know, 30 or 40 meters. But the, the thing about it is they're at full speed and she was at zero. <laughs> right. So, right. So yeah. she had to get up and run. She didn't fall down and complain and fall down and pull someone else with her. She didn't fall down and ask the ref for a redo or beat yeah. herself up for not being good enough. She fell down, got up, ran. Why? Because she knew what her outcome was. And this was like, oh, shit. You know, she, I don't even think she said, oh, shit. She just yeah, fell she... down up and ran. Yep. Now, what's fascinating to me is if her coach on that morning had said, okay, it's, you know, the 15th meet of the year or whatever. Like, this is something they do every week. Yeah. I want you to beat these girls by a long shot because enough of this playing small, Heather, you know, I want you to show these girls what, you're what I think you're really made of. She would have been like, No. Like, coach, you're crazy. And he was like, I really believe in you, Heather. This is the importance of when someone wants to change, okay? So even if the coach was a super positive thinker and really saw the potential, she wouldn't have believed him because there was no reason to believe. Right. Then she wipes it out, gets up, still has to win the race, put herself at a 30-meter disadvantage, had to find a level she didn't even know she had. Right. Beats them. Now she knows she can beat them by more than 30 meters because she did it. Now she has a reason to believe, believe change. Yeah. That's it. 
So, but she didn't know she had that level because she had never been required to operate from it. Right. So the chaos you're experiencing in your world right now is requiring you to dig deeper. Okay. And I know for a fact, this is probably my only Pollyanna statement of the, of the interview. You are more than you think you are. Here, let's do a quick, this is a super quick visualization exercise. You do it. All right, right. let's do it. So just, just if, if you're not driving, if you're driving, just cancel, do, don't, do not do this. Okay. Only if you're not driving. So just close your eyes and imagine your capacity. Imagine how, like who you think you are. Okay. Just get a, can you get a sense of who you think you are and your limits? Okay. Now, can you agree that you're probably more than that? Actually, can you sort of expand? You're you're more than that, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'd like you to consider that you're more than that. See if you can expand that again. It's getting a little more nebulous. Right. Now, just notice how you're more than that too. And just notice how there's really no end to your greatness. Right. The container is something that you defined. It actually can, it has the possibility of extending out to infinity. Right. Right. So that I can tell you is the fundamental basis of why I get out of bed in the morning, which is, so my why is to reveal greatness. And I I spent days, weeks um, coming up with that, those two words, because the presupposition is that it's already there. You have everything you need. Greatness mm. abides in you, and in infinite potential is there. My work, the reason I exist in this form, is to help people reveal it. Reveal it means I don't do the work they do. I help, and I don't impose it on anybody. Okay? Right. So it, if someone doesn't want to change, there's nothing you can do to change them. If someone wants to change, there's nothing you can do to stop them. She wanted to win that race. Right. And those Nobody. girls couldn't stop her. Right. Get it? And so therefore she she changed because when we decide, Providence, you know, steps in. And and I go back to you have to want it. So it's got to be something you want. Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. It's not rocket science. And you have to be willing to give what it takes. And if you're at a place where you feel like you've hit your limit, then you're finally being required to dig deeper. Just start with the assumption that you have a deeper level. You don't need to know what it is and then fake it till you make it. Right. Right. And then the techniques and, you know, I mean, obviously come, come study with us. I mean, whatever. I mean, it's like our door is open. We, we offer, I have so much stuff out there that people could do. It would cost nothing except time, which is very valuable. But at the beginning of every program, I promise a return on investment of time. Right. Right. Because it really is just the choice to change the cause to see a different effect. Well, I think that's a perfect place to stop. I want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, we're going to link to uh, to your website um, and your social media that you do have. It may not be on your phone, but you do have social media. Yeah, well, um, I, but I have to go in through the computer and I got to log in manually. It's very, very. It's got to be very, very conscious effort of yours. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. I know personally. I don't know, mid forties, existential, you know, debates, internal questions. I felt like this is the perfect guest to have on right now. Um, so I want to thank you personally um, and on behalf of all of our, uh, our viewers and listeners. Well, I, I really thank you for having me. I, I mean, just so you know, I love doing this in case it wasn't clear. And um, your, your questions, some of the things I said today, I've never said before, even though I thought them. Right. And so yeah. thanks for asking such awesome questions and really delivering uh, insightful value to the people who listen to your podcast, because they will benefit from questions that have never been asked before. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, look forward to having you back again soon. Oh, yeah, please. Thanks, Gina. OK, bye bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I found it incredibly fascinating and I actually took notes throughout this one for things that I know I'm going to start applying. 
to get these results that Gina knows that we can all do. If you like the episode, please hit the like button down below and subscribe so you'll automatically be notified when we drop our next episode. Until then, keep propelling you and your business forward.